times faster? Or are you unhappy that it's not going 64 times faster? Because the C++ people can't get it working at all and it goes slower. It goes one times <laughs> faster when you do it. You know? So all oh, we're quite happy, actually. So you have to get the context right. You know, we actually know how to scale things up. We can drop them onto multi cores so they go a lot faster. Usually if they don't go faster, it's because the code has got some sequential bottlenecks in. We have tools to find the sequential bottlenecks and we can tweak it a bit and we usually get pretty good performance gains. So we consider that problem more or less solved. We wonder why everybody else doesn't do it that way. Well, they're all nuts. <laughs> uh, Erlang plays extremely well with other languages, but not into memory. So we don't like linking other things in memory with us. In fact, some of us are a bit paranoid about that because it would breach our integrity. We run them in separate memory spaces. We talk to each other, which of course makes it possible to make them reliable and scalable. That's a side effect of putting them in a different memory space. Uh, some of the stuff, uh, yeah, this is, uh, this, this I never know what to put here. Um, it's sort of changing. Uh, this is stuff we've shipped. Some of, this is the biggest, uh, it's an Ericsson product. Um, uh, which is the AXP301. It is market leading in its market segment. Uh, it's an asynchronous transfer mode switch, uh, which seamlessly scales from 16 to 160 gigabits per second by adding more modules. The trouble is, that data rate is so powerful that no country needs to buy more than one of them. So, <laughs> so you know, although it's a great product, uh, we haven't sold many of them. <laughs> We have sold them to British Telecom, so if, you, if you're in Britain and you use the internet, it's controlled by an airline controlled switch. And it had, uh, when I last looked at it, 2.6 million lines of airline in it. And that's uh, quite big, and it's driven by about 60 odd programmers, so it's, uh, it's quite a big project. And the Ericsson GPRS, which was developed in Gothenburg, just down the road, in LA, uh, large parts of it. Uh, Ericsson is also doing some other stuff, you know, then. but it's all secret, so I can't tell you about it. <laughs> but it's jolly good fun. Um, banking is a uh, Klarna, is uh, it called Klarna? Yeah, they do. Credito, Klarna is um, a finance place in Stockholm that uh, has, I don't know, 100 airline programs or 50 or, I mean, a lot of them. Every time I talk to them, they came at the Airline Conference and, um, and uh, there was a guy there saying, Oh, Klarna's, Klarna's up at 250 people, he said, on stage. And I, 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 I talked to the head of software, but uh, PhD in computer science from Uppsala, said, I thought you were up to 300. He said 250. And then he said, no, no, we're 400, actually. <laughs> they're, 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 like, they're doubling every five minutes. <laughs> they will actually be bigger than Microsoft and Google put together in about three years. Or so. <laughs> <laughs> something, something will probably happen before then. Um, messaging? Um, this is quite fun. This is, uh, I, 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 the, the slide says a billion messages a day. It, Facebook chat is uh, uh, written in LA. So if you use Facebook, whatever that is, um, there's, a, there's a chat application. And if you sniff the headers, that's quite fun, sniff the headers with a packet sniffer, you'll see, you'll see it says, says, so I've powered my mocky web, it says, which is quite nice. And I think, it, um, I, think I read somewhere up at 3 billion messages a day. So it's quite, that, that's, um, that's quite fun. Uh, RabbitMQ, uh, that was bought by... Um, a company, it's sort of, it's, RabbitMQ is an implementation of the AMQP, which sounds for the Advanced Message Queue Protocol. And RabbitMQ did this in Erlang. We were the first people to implement this standard, which is an international standard for messaging. Uh, turned out there are like 150 different messaging, proprietary messaging solutions for IBM makes messaging, it's primarily used by the banks. The banking world thought it would get its act together. So Merrill Lynch and a few other big banks went together and made AMQP. Uh, and this is a persistent message queue, which is fault tolerant. Um, put messages in, it's low latency, fault tolerant binary protocol. It's very, very useful. And the first, probably the best implementation in the world is, is, is in LA. 
Rabbit MQ made this. They were then acquired by VMware. You know, VMware. Mm -hmm. And it's being put into VMware. So Erlang will be running inside every VMware box um, as a messaging interface to manage the whole thing. Uh, CouchDB, which you all know and love, is actually shipped in uh, Ubuntu now. Uh, if you look at Ubuntu, I used to do kill all beam, you know, but bits of Ubuntu will stop working if you do that now because there's two beam processes which is CouchDB is running out of the box actually. It's used for managing bookmarks and, and things and, and the uh, Ubuntu pieces need to make it. It's also used by CERN to, um, in the Large Hadron, uh, you know, the, the hunt for the Higgs boson and all that stuff, they're, 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 they use CouchDB to store all the data. So this 10 petabytes of particle physics data coming into a cat into an Erlang database. That's so, uh, Amazon. But it, GitHub uses it as a sort of thing, middleware to dispatch stuff and do things. Uh, eJabbard is the widest used Jabber protocol for instant messaging. Um, and there's some other things all over the place. Yeah, right. Well, I think so to finish. Yes. And then we can, those of you who don't want to have a chat or things, questions might be good. Any questions? No questions? <laughs> yes. I have a question about the semantics of the language. Have you ever worked out the formal semantics of the language? Formal? Well, we've got some informal semantics. Well, the formal semantics, yes, sir. It's all the C, that's the formal semantics. So if, if you knew what C meant, you would know what it meant. Uh, there are, yeah, there are one or two PhD theses on the semantics. They model bits of it. I think uh, we haven't, we're not a theory group. Uh, I know people have modeled subsets of it. And, and actually, that's not quite true. We have applied theorem proving techniques to certain algorithms written in we have to make certain simplifying assumptions there. So modeling cues is a bit so we can grow indefinitely. <clears throat> As it seems right now, Erlang has good impact on the CPU and all the stuff, but I wanted to know, like, in the future, does it go to the web and, uh, like, protocols, HTTP, and uh, will it have any influence on them, like the parallel systems? Or like TCPI people have, I mean, because we are seeing this change over programming languages now. But uh, about the protocols on net, well, they're changing as well. But they're, they're, I think they've changed less rapidly. I mean, we're seeing predator SCTP replacing HTTP, and, and uh, would Erlang influence that? Probably not. Because they're in this middle space. You know, you're not in the, the bits at the end. You're in what's on the lines. Uh, TCP has been pretty good, actually. And UDP. SCTP gives you sort of logical channels, which you want. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think it's sort of orthogonal. So that's a sort of architecture of the hardware sort of thing. Just about a very weird inverse question to ask you. Uh, <laughs> seeing as how you explained so much and I get the feeling that you've worked with this for so long, is there anything that Erlang does not go well with? Oh, absolutely, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's very bad at, um, well, of course, it's inefficient. You know, I mean, it's never going to be as efficient as you can, cha you can change the code on the fly in Erlang. You can do anything. You can just, as you're executing it, you can change new code. That means every function call is an indirect call. There's an indirection pointer for every call. So if you optimize that away, you could go, you can make function calls about 15% faster. So there are certain intrinsic inefficiencies, but they are there because if, if you threw that away, it wouldn't be fault tolerant. You know, you need certain things to make it fault tolerant. So it's not the most efficient thing. And it's very bad at doing in-memory operations um, because it doesn't know what memory is. I mean, it's just memory is virtual. So, it, you know, if, 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 sort of packing memory, if you're doing compression algorithms and, and uh, 
say, if you want to decode a JPEG, you know, you've got to do these fast Fourier transforms and things. But, but that's crazy. I mean, I see a split. I mean, so how do we? I mean, Ericsson, right? I work for Ericsson. How do we use? How do we use a language like Erlang? So we use a language like Erlang in the control plane. We control stuff in Erlang. We tell we tell black boxes what to do. How do we program the black boxes? We program them with FPGAs, right? So, you know, they're like 3,000 times faster than C, okay? So there isn't this gap. You know, either you go to hardware. If you want fast stuff, you go to hardware. Uh, if you want slow stuff, you can use LA. If you want logic control stuff. There is a sort of middle ground, C, which is pretty good for fast stuff where you don't want to go to hardware. If you want really fast stuff, you go to hardware. And I think C is going to become... The, the other thing I haven't talked about, but, but what I sort of... I, I sort of fell in love with last week with 